Uh, and good morning, everyone. I'm uh, happy to be here. Um, ironically, I wanted to be in the office uh, while giving this presentation. Uh, my car and the driveways uh, where I'm at didn't really agree with me. Um, so I am working hybrid and I'm working from home. So I think that's um, kind of a fitting way to start. So let me add my presentation here. So yes, we're here to talk about the hybrid workforce. Uh, you know, it's it goes without saying why it's so important. You know, a lot has changed in the world of work in the past three years. But I mean, the HR professionals who are with me today and, and you know, people who have who work in the field of work know that there have been many remote workers and hybrid workers even before 2020. And so the idea of what is a remote work policy, it, it might not be new to a lot of employers. For those employers where it is still new or they're still managing it and they're still kind of understanding what are the best practices, that's really what I want to focus on today, especially the, you know, the best practices. So if you do have any questions, I'm happy to take them uh, during our chat here. You can uh, type them in directly into the uh, the chat and I have that posted here and feel free to ask them uh, uh, throughout the presentation. If you'd like to unmute and turn your camera on and, uh, and ask in person, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well and, and to engage in that dialogue. So if there are some parts of the presentation we don't get to, I'm happy to share that with, with you uh, after today's presentation. So really, you know, I want to just start kind of the benefits, <clears throat> excuse me, of hybrid work, just to, to kind of highlight them. There definitely is a lot of uh, uh, benefits to allowing employees to have that, flexi <clears throat> that flexibility. So, uh, you know, I've, uh, a colleague of mine, and I should give credit, one of our articles students, Melissa, uh, had helped me prepare this presentation. And so she collected some statistics saying that, and I do have a source if you want to see it, 99% uh, of knowledge workers see the benefits of working from home with increased flexibility, not having a commute and, and more time to spend with friends and family. I mean, 99% is pretty uh, high. That's a, a high percentage, but um, you know, the, that's what this dimensional research said. They said 95, uh, at the same time, 95% of workers want to return to work for the team building, for collaboration, connection. So uh, there's there's two sides to the to the benefits. I mean, where there are people can collaborate at work together. They appreciate that, but they also appreciate the flexibility. You know, there are certain tax benefits that some employees can get as another benefit potentially for them. So they might appreciate that. But really it's the flexibility, it's the autonomy where, where I've really seen from our clients and from speaking with, with other employees, where they see the benefits of that. But of course, there are probably more pitfalls than there are benefits. And really that depends on the, you know, the, the nature of the relationship, the nature of the business. There are just certain jobs that simply can't be performed hybrid. Uh, so obviously we're not talking about those. We're talking more about the office jobs and things like that. So, you know, being able to monitor employees, you know, understanding their productivity, you know, ensuring that they're meeting expectations. Those are, you know, at least some of the challenges that employers are facing. Jurisdiction issues, we'll touch upon that as well. If you have an employee, uh, they're working partially remotely, partially from the office, but when they're working remotely, perhaps they're in another jurisdiction. That can, there are potential issues that can come up and, and we'll address those too. So, uh, but, you know, overall, I've, I've spoken with a lot of clients you know, the idea of retention, the idea of loyalty, you know, employee loyalty to their employers, that definition has changed. Okay, so hybrid work, remote work is a one is one tool out of the many tools employers have to ensure, you know, retention, to make their, their workplace a destination for workers. 
it does include some additional work, maybe that hadn't really been done before this time. Uh, something I hear a lot of uh, employers do is this idea of hoteling. Uh, so there can be, you know, some pros and cons really with, with hoteling. Um, and I've also heard just kind of anecdotally, this is from another MBOT meeting, uh, Janet Wardle, one of the CEOs of uh, MH Aerospace Canada. I believe she, she was telling a story that she had brought people together in the office. Uh, some, were, some were remote, some were working from the office, and they had a meeting. And one of the people who was working from the office logged into the meeting virtual, even though the, the meeting was taking place at the office, right? So it's, it's you know, how people are being brought together, how people are working, you know, it, that really, that definition is really changing. So um, I, I wanna briefly touch upon, you know, what is hybrid work? Really it's different for all different types of, of employers, all different types of employees. These are generally the types of arrangements that I've seen and that I've advised employers on, uh, but really it, it, there is no one size fits all. So, you know, there can be a remote first um, a type of policy. And that's really, you know, probably gives the most flexibility to employees. You know, they're, they're primarily it's understood, primarily they're going to be working remotely. You know, you can change it. Maybe there's office occasional is what some employers are calling it where it's, you know, maybe there's no fixed days that uh, certain employees are to be in the office, you know, but, but it's understood that they will be in the office occasionally, you know, office first, but remote allowed. That's something I've been seeing probably more frequently that it's understood that employees will be in the office, you know, and some remote work is allowed possibly with, you know, permission, from a supervisor or manager, uh, possibly, you know, they don't need that permission. Um, and then lastly, you know, kind of flexible or fixed arrangements, you know, giving more of that flexibility and options to the employee. You know, there, there are really, oh, and I should say fixed arrangements where maybe it's just understood the employee will be, you know, working, you know, remotely these three days in the office, you know, these two days, uh, maybe there's different teams that are in the office on certain days uh, and it's understood, you know, and the employer can manage, you know, they, they have a, a fixed understanding of who's going to be in the office at the same time. So perhaps their footprint in terms of their lease or the space that they need is reduced. There's, there probably would be benefits from that. And really, it's just that more certainty with a, a more of a fixed uh, arrangement. So I, I see there's a question about uh, software that monitors employees. So I will be getting to that because I think that's an important piece of uh, of hybrid work. Uh, but really, you know, or it's become more prevalent really with two reasons. One, uh, the Ontario government's decision to uh, force employers to declare if they monitor their employees. Uh, and there was also a more recent case, a small claims case, where an employer was successful in, in not only upholding their monitoring uh, uh, abilities and, and history of monitoring, but they used it successfully against an employee to, to deny uh, you know, additional pay to an employee. So um, I'll, I'll give some more detail on that uh, section, but really, you know, it, it really, it, electronic monitoring and monitoring of employees, it's a very you know, workplace specific topic. There might be certain um, types of work. Let's say if it's you know really um, like a call center based work, or they're dealing with you know customer service, and it may be understood. You know we've all been on hold. It says your call may be monitored for training quality purposes. There are some industries where electronic monitoring has been standard for many many years, right? So for those employers, of course, it won't be a surprise to those employees that they're being monitored. Um, and, but, you know, maybe the general kind of office worker, maybe at a law firm or an accounting firm, sales, things like that, um, the monitoring may not have been expected. And so there's definitely communication that has to go on uh, if an employer is going to do that. But really, with the new law that came forward, and, and I'll, I'll touch upon it now, and we're going to get to it later, too. Uh, 
it didn't prohibit an employer to electronically monitor their employees. It just simply said that employer has to declare. Well, if they're doing monitoring, why they do it, how they do it, you know, and, and disclose that to the employee more than just, you know, a smile, you're on can of camera uh, poster, you know, in the, in the lobby. So we'll touch upon um, uh, so, uh, you know, remote or electronic monitoring software uh, shortly. But where I wanted to start here and kind of get more discussion going and, and prompt you to ask more questions is more of these specific legal potential pitfalls of, of hybrid work, remote working. I will talk about the best practices and I will of course talk about electronic monitoring as well. Um, instead of you know talking about you know, what is hybrid work because it's so flexible for and different for each employer, I wanted to talk about these high level topics of I think what any employer who does hybrid work needs to keep in mind, okay? So first of all, it's overtime. Uh, and we're not talking about those employees who are exempt from overtime. In Ontario, of course, there are plenty of employees who are not entitled to overtime pay. Um, lawyers for one, lawyers are technically not entitled to any overtime pay. Sorry about that. Lawyers are technically not entitled to any overtime pay. Uh, and of course, managers are probably the, the biggest exception. If someone truly is a manager, they are not entitled to overtime. They can be working from home. They might be working from the office. If they are a manager or a supervisor, they do not receive overtime pay. But the key there is they have to be performing, you know, the majority of their tasks as managerial or supervisory duties. So one potential pitfall for an employee who is working hybrid, perhaps their title is manager, but when you know the majority of their tasks are not managerial or supervisory in nature, that employee technically would be entitled to overtime pay. And so, you know, in Ontario, overtime is after they've worked. 44 hours in one week. Uh, different provinces in Canada have different standards for what overtime is. And so of course that matters if there's an employee who's well, working a little more permanently in another province, and we'll talk about that. Um, but overtime, uh, an employee who, you know, the employer might not see that this employee is actually working more hours uh, than, than they thought. That employee may be entitled to additional overtime pay. The employer might not know at the time when the employee uh, when the overtime is is being worked that uh, the employee you know is entitled to that. Typically, it comes out you know usually at the end of an employment arrangement. It could be at the resignation or even the termination, where an employee claims afterwards, "Well, I worked all this overtime. I've I've worked consistently until you know you know two extra hours every day." Uh, and if they are not exempt, they may be entitled to that overtime pay. So it's definitely something to, to keep in mind. And also, I think if employers are expecting employees to work, you know, additional hours because they may not have to commute. Um, I, I, you know, there aren't really any cases that I've found about that yet with, you know, employees who, who you know, their employment has ended and they've claimed additional hours you know, in relation to being a hybrid worker. We're gonna need a few more years for those cases to make their way through the court, but we're waiting for it, we're waiting for it. Uh, potential constructive dismissal, this relates to overtime as well. If an employee wasn't expected to work these additional hours, but now they do for, for whatever reason, it could be there aren't enough workers or you know they have too much work or, or whatever the case may be. There is a chance for a claim of constructive dismissal for, for dealing with hybrid workers. It's not only on the overtime piece, it's really any of the, the terms of employment. Constructive dismissal for, for you know, uh, the HR professionals here who, who work in this space, there are really two main definitions of, of constructive dismissal, but really it has to do with, is there a significant change that was made to the employment arrangement without the employee's approval and without reasonable notice. 
So significant unilateral change without reasonable notice. And just generally, has the employer shown that they don't want to be bound by the original employment contract? So in order to find out, okay, well, have I constructively dismissed an employee? Or have I fired an employee without knowing I fired them? First, we have to understand what is their original employment agreement? So for, for hybrid workers, one of the biggest pitfalls that I've seen is where, you know, they might casually request, you know, hybrid work. And perhaps it was at the beginning of the pandemic, the middle, the end. But then the employee has come to expect that that is now their standard term of employment, that they perhaps they have that flexibility. They don't have to come into the office two or three times a week. Uh, there is, you know, an idea within employment law that if as an employer you condone or, you're, you know, you're aware of a certain situation uh, and you, you, you know, you don't protest it, you don't ask the employee to change, you haven't, you haven't disciplined the employee. If they've been doing something for, you know, more than an insignificant period of time, the terms of employment may have already changed. So, Perhaps as it applies to hybrid workers, uh, you know, regardless of, you know, the, the, the situation that was affecting, you know, the world for the pandemic, there probably would be a judge in Ontario who says, well, if an employee has been working hybrid for the past three years, you know, we're, we're coming on to the, the three-year anniversary right now. If they've been working hybrid for three years, and let's say, you know, they started six months before, you know, the pandemic started. Well, the majority, the vast majority of their time with the employer has been hybrid. It has been, a, it is a term, standard term of their employment. So if an employer were to then force every employee or, or, you know, to come back to the office, they're going to get rid of hybrid work, there could be a constructive dismissal that's happened. So it's going to depend on each employee. I mean, we could change the facts. If you have an employee who's worked for 15 years and you know, maybe for the first year and a half of the pandemic, they work remotely and then they've been kind of hybrid since then, you know, an employer may have a, a case, to, an argument to say, well, you know, it was really temporary. It was only when the pandemic was, you know, really, really going on when the emergency was declared. As soon as the emergency was not declared as soon as it was, was taken away, we got everyone to come back to the office. So no, it wasn't, uh, you know, the change to remote work or hybrid work wasn't related to the a change to their employment terms. It was really just adapting to the emergency. Once the emergency was off, then we, you know, we brought them back to their standard terms of employment. So there's, there's that, you know, constructive dismissal really has to do with a gap of the of the um, expectations, you know, expectation versus reality. What did the employer communicate? Things like that. Uh, I see a question here from Dinah. Good morning, Dinah. Uh, so she's asked to prevent constructive dismissal when providing the hybrid work module. Uh, but now the employer wants to return to the office. Do you suggest a clause be inserted into new employment offers going forward? That's a fantastic question. So first, it assumes that there is an employment agreement. Okay, so if there isn't an employment agreement, the clause might exist, but it's really just verbally. And so, well, how can that be changed? It could be changed verbally, but it also could be changed in writing. And really, it's preferable. You know, the law prefers it, the court prefers it. The best advice I give employers is, you know, it's always better to confirm all of the terms of employment in, in, in an employment agreement. So to, to prevent the constructive dismissal, you know, could we could we add those terms to an employment contract? Certainly, right? And I think, you know, it really depends on the, you know, the, the employer, the nature of the, the industry they work in. But if, if it's really, you know, if hybrid work was only meant to be temporary, there's probably more than just uh, uh, one source of that information. There are probably policies that were written. I'm sure there are emails. So it's not going to be a surprise. I think the, the key you know, or, or the, the, the thread that is through a lot of constructive dismissal claims is that the change was unexpected, right? It was a significant change. Like I said, significant change, unilateral change. 
made without notice. Well, if it's if it's not unexpected, I think it's going to be a lot more difficult for that employee to claim, well, you know, you changed my employment. So if it's if the clause is in the employment contract, I think you can prevent that, you know, expectation versus reality, but also, you know, get that that um, that surprise element if the employer wants to, you know, make that change. And also, you know, the last thing I'll say about that, and we'll talk about employment contracts near the end as well, is, is it a significant change? That's really the, the first step of any constructive dismissal uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. Dealing with accommodation. So accommodation has, you know, it's, it's, I've only seen increases in requests for accommodation for human rights reasons uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you know, any employer knows uh, their obligations under the human rights code. You know, an employer has a, a legal obligation, a duty to reasonably accommodate their employees based on the prohibited grounds to the point of undue hardship. Uh, for better or for worse, the pandemic showed a lot of employers you know, where the limits of that undue hardship can be in relation, not, not just to their, the, the operation of their business, but how they, you know, are managing their team, what can be done where, and, you know, how employees, you know, work and, and, and perform tasks for the operation. So, um, you know, the, the, the idea of accommodation, it's, uh, I, I think it's 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 gained a lot more uh, publicity since the beginning of the pandemic. Really, I'm I'm waiting for a case to come through either the court or the human rights tribunal, where an employer and I haven't seen it yet, where an employer you know denied an employee the ability to work in a hybrid method, and the denial was seen to be discriminatory. I haven't seen those cases just yet. The Human Rights Tribunal is slightly you know, backed up. Uh, but, you know, if an employee can prove that uh, providing that accommodation, hybrid work, is not undue hardship on the employer, the employer has, not, has an obligation to provide that accommodation to the employee. So we're waiting for those cases. Uh, you know, accommodation, we could really do a whole presentation on accommodation, but I wanted to touch upon that because there are more requests being made for hybrid work remote work for employees. Um, disconnecting from work, uh, I've done previous presentations on that, so this is not a new uh, topic. It's about a year, last April, that came into effect. So an employer, you know, in Ontario, at a minimum, if they have at least 25 employees, they have to have a policy or a statement on disconnecting from work. The employer does not have to provide a right to disconnect, but they have to have a statement on it. So, you know, this kind of relates to the overtime piece as well. For employees who are working from home, are we making sure that they are, you know, doing, you know, what they are required to do within the times that they're, you know, required to do it and not extra? Do they know that they can disconnect from work? And lastly, on this point of, of potential pitfalls, performance reviews, I think, are only going to be uh, more important for, for workers, but especially for hybrid workers and remote workers. Um, really, I've said it before uh, in other presentations, I'll repeat it here too. I think the idea of the annual performance review, it should really be a collection of the feedback that was already given to the employee. That's, that's really how I see it. So A, that assumes that the employee is receiving this feedback on a regular basis, positive and negative, okay? Um, so, and, and it's being documented. And, you know, for other people who have been on my, uh, our other presentations, they'll know, you know, document, document, document. Good and bad, there's nothing wrong with, with recording uh, good feedback for employees. I think it's heightened for hybrid workers because those, uh, the idea of autonomy and flexibility is good, but there's it really comes down to trust, right? Trust that um, you know the employees are are going to do what you know they're set out to do and what they're paid to do, 
Um, and instead of employers, you know, watching the employees or, or overseeing what they do, there's really that emphasis on the output. Uh, there's a focus on the result. There's a focus on the deliverables. So if the employee only is only receiving feedback maybe once or twice a year, uh, it's going to be difficult to, uh, you know, understand if they're being accountable, if they're if they're doing what they are set out to do. Uh, you know, the, those employees who might take advantage of hybrid work, you know, they can be dealt with through the discipline process. Uh, but generally, you know, performance reviews, like I said, they should be done you know, on a regular basis. And then at the annual performance review, you review all of the, you know, other uh, performance. Uh, and as it, it comes down to electronic monitoring, um, I prepared, you know, there, there's a, a lot of notes on this, but I wanna summarize it. So I think what goes with performance management for some employers is this electronic monitor, okay? So for employers in Ontario, if they do any form of electronic monitoring, they have to disclose it to their employees, right? That's been the law in Ontario for, for several months now. Um, and of course, it's, it is only for larger employers. So employers, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, that have more than 25 or 25 or more uh, employees. So if you're a small business and you engage in electronic monitoring, you don't have to disclose that. Uh, and, and this didn't create new rights for the employee. And it's similar to that right to disconnect. There's no new right to disconnect if an employer doesn't want to provide that. And there is no new right for an employee to be free from electronic monitoring. But really what it is, is for electronic monitoring, if it's done, you know, the employer has to say how it's done, why it's done, and, and, and to provide more detail on that. It, you know, uh, if you, you know, Google the city of Toronto's uh, electronic monitoring policy. There's actually a great deal that they've taken the time to you know, really parse out all the different types of electronic monitoring. It would include GPS tracking, which is a lot more prevalent for fleet vehicles and for those uh, employees who travel. Uh, it can be keystroke software. If if uh, an employer you know maintains a record of internet history, is that a form of electronic monitoring? Right, um, you know, if an employer regularly reviews it, if they if they get data on the employee's use of a uh, of company software, tech, uh, tech, etc., does the employer keep track of that? Do they monitor it? So it's there's it's a it's a wider policy, maybe wider than some employers might know. So let me talk briefly about this this small claims court case from BC. So it did get a lot of, uh, of attention. This was at, at the beginning of this year. So it's not just a small claims court matter, it's a small, small claims court matter in British Columbia. But really the, the employee had been terminated. And she, uh, in, uh, in response, she commenced a, a claim, again, a small, small claims court claim for termination pay for severance pay in British Columbia. And part of the employer's defense was the uh, argument of time fact that, well, in fact, the employee didn't work all of the hours that she said she worked. Uh, what the employer did through their electronic monitoring software, they showed that they, they gave detail of the software usage of the employee in relation to her time sheet. So this employee had to had to fill out timesheets. Not every employee fills out timesheets, uh, or perhaps you know keeps track of every task that they do. In certain industries, they do, but the majority they don't. This employee did, uh, and the employer also gave into put into evidence the training videos that they showed the employee about you know how their how their uh, work is monitored and how to input their time. That was put into evidence. So the employer alleged that, okay, the employee wasn't actually working for all of the time that she said she was working. So while the employee had claimed something like $1,300 for unpaid wages and another $4,000 for severance pay, the employer, in fact, countersued for 
the 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 wages that they said were overpaid. So the employer did convince that um, small small claims court that it was right, and the adjudicator agreed. The adjudicator said that trust and honesty were essential, and the in, in the employment relationship, and that the adjudicator did find that the employee wasn't working when she had said on her timesheets that she was working. Uh, there was about 51 hours of time that were unaccounted for from her timesheets to what she was actually doing on the company software. Uh, and actually this software, I think it was called Time Camp. It could tell when the employee was using a work program, using a non-work program, when, when they were accessing client files, even when they were printing. That's the level of detail that this employer received. So it's really, they understood really every task that the employee was doing. And so that employer, that employer was successful in, 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 in at least not paying termination pay and you know, getting a judgment in their favor. So, you know, the, the implications of monitoring, this is, like I said, it was a, not just a small claims court matter. It was a small, small claims court matter. The, the, the British Columbia Civil Resolution Tribunal, which is really just up to, I think, $5,000. Uh, Ontario doesn't have a similar uh, tribunal like that. But, you know, it, it really exposed for a lot of employers and employees what they might be able to do with, um, with employee or electronic monitoring. So as it relates to hybrid workers, um, you know, what I would say is number one, if you're going to monitor employees, it should be done on a consistent basis, okay? And what is consistent will depend on each employer. You know, it, and it should also be done fairly, it should be done in good faith. So if the company chooses perhaps only to monitor hybrid or, or, or I should say remote workers, well, it's not fair you know, in the context of all of their workers, you know, so would they monitor only when people are not in the office? You know, is that fair? Every employer has an obligation to treat their employees in good faith. Uh, that doesn't have to be written down in, in a contract. It, it pervades the employment relationship from before it starts until even after it ends, uh, dealing your, with your employees in good faith. Um, you know, and I, for Ontario, at least, it has to be disclosed. So in British Columbia, there wasn't the same policy that an employer had to disclose electronic monitoring, but they did, they did do that. They did disclose it to, uh, uh, to the employee because she was even trained on it and she understood what she had to do. So uh, I think that clarity, uh, the disclosure, the communication, the training is all key if electronic monitoring is going to be done uh, in, in a workplace. So now I want to talk about, you know, for, for kind of the second half of the presentation is really delving into the best practices, you know, understanding, you know, not just the pitfalls, but okay, well, what are the more positive things and what can we do to possibly avoid, you know, trouble in the future? So uh, like I just mentioned, clarity in and, and everything an employer does. I think really that's the standard that the law demands, really. judges demand it from employers. Uh, it, you know, employers are, the Supreme Court of Canada has said that, you know, they will hold employers to a higher standard than they do employees. And that relates to termination pay, it relates to obviously the duty of good faith, as I said. And so where something is made clear to, to the workforce, I think you know the employer can you know possibly avoid liability, but just really avoid you know misunderstandings, avoid you know missed expectations. So as it relates to hybrid workers, you know clarity on the eligibility, who can be a, a hybrid worker and who cannot, and instead of you know doing it on an ad hoc basis or a one-off basis. If employees understand, okay, well, if I do this type of work, I'm eligible for hybrid work. 
if I don't do this type of work, I'm not eligible for a hybrid work, right? Um, uh, unintentionally, perhaps there might be a hierarchy created, but I really see it as this is it's, it's clear, and this is the you know the standard that's going to be enforced consistently. Right? Um, the policies, I, I mean, you know, just back to eligibility. I mean, you know, there should be you know, different standards related to uh, those employees who are allowed to work uh, remotely uh, part of the time. So it's you know expectations with uh, performance expectations on availability, expectations on communications, right? Really, this speaks to policies, but really the expectations of the, of the, of the work that they're doing. Um, it's not just the, the you know, hybrid work policy. It's really every, frankly, every policy really needs to be clarified because there are health and safety issues as they relate to uh, any worker. I mean, in, in Ontario, the Occupational Health and Safety Act does not apply to employees' homes. That was some of the questions we got at the very beginning. Well, do we have to make sure that the employee's home is safe? And in Ontario, no. The Occupational Health and Safety Act doesn't apply there. But for other provinces, the Occupational Health and Safety Act does apply. Really, every other province except for Ontario. The, their occupational health and safety legislation applies even to the employee's home. So Ontario is a special exception. So clarifying, you know, any policy is going to be important. Uh, you know, clarifying expectations on, like I said, the, the different types of hybrid work. Uh, I think where there are the expectations that are left unsaid, it leads to you know, um, well, I mean, I mean, communication issues and, you know, perhaps performance issues in the future. And I think the employer who clearly states what they expect from their employees, uh, you know, they benefit from that. It's really, you know, as it relates to performance issues, you know, the, the probably the most common standard in the Employment Standards Act or in relation to termination is willful misconduct, right? But there's really one of three reasons to, uh, uh, to terminate an employee without notice. And th there are other reasons, but those are the three main ones. Willful misconduct, disobedience, and willful neglect of duty. That standard of willful is actually so important and much more important than uh, 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 employers might have known before. Uh, there was a case uh, that was uh, released last year, and I've mentioned it before in some of my other presentations, about the, the manager employee who worked for an elevator company, and he was found to have been, you know, sexually harassed by an employee, but the court said that the employer couldn't prove that it was willful misconduct. The, the court found it was misconduct, but it wasn't willful misconduct, and that was really because the employer couldn't show that they had told the employee about the standards, that they explained it, perhaps done some training on it, right? But I think that that similar idea applies here to hybrid work and the expectations and the policies that employers have. They should be clearly explained. If you have certain standards on communication, that should be explained, you know, to, to employees. Uh, about being at the office for a certain amount of days, that should be clearly explained, right? Um, and perhaps the... the hybrid work model has a certain start date and end date. That's, that's not unreasonable to do. It could be, we're gonna do a pilot project for the next year and we're going to allow this. And when it expires, we're going back to normal. So I think employers shouldn't be afraid to consider, you know, doing a, like I said, a, a pilot project in relation to hybrid work. I talk about reviewing and adjusting uh, uh, policies and really any, any of their practices. I don't, employers should not be afraid to review and adjust their policies, you know, as they see fit. They should be doing it on a reasonable basis, on a good faith basis. Uh, if it's not a significant change, an employer can make whatever change they want without notice and without the employee's approval. Perhaps you know the change from hybrid work to in-office work 
perhaps it could be more significant depending on the employee, depending on you know their situation. Uh, I mean, the law really demands that employers are constantly at least reviewing their policies and adjusting if necessary. So I just had one quick question. Um, so if you had employees or volunteers out of the province, how would you manage that health and safety aspect with that homework? That's a, a very good question. Thank you. So uh, my answer, the short answer is very carefully. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to be tongue in cheek. Um, so you know, as a generally health and safety, um, health and safety rules across the, the country are generally similar. You know, employers have obligations to uh, to take generally take all precautions as it relates to health and safety. Okay, um, so in Ontario, okay, well maybe employers don't have to ensure that someone's home is safe, but it doesn't rise to the level of okay, well does the employer have to make sure that the employee doesn't have wet floors, you know, while they're working so they don't slip and fall. Like there is an element, and I think even in, in any province, I think a, a judge would accept that the employer doesn't have full control of what goes on in an employee's home. But it really, it applies to the areas that the employer does have control over. Okay, so uh, you know, there's you know the easier ones, which is you know workplace harassment, workplace violence. Perhaps okay, if someone working. Um, uh, remotely might not experience workplace violence, although threats of violence do count of, of workplace violence. But workplace harassment, that's an important part of any, you know, workplace health and safety. Um, ergonomics, right? There, I've seen uh, other lawyers and, and I've spoken with clients about, okay, well, is it the employer's duty to make sure that the employee is, you know, when they're working for us, that they're sitting in an appropriate workspace? And if we extrapolate that, does the employer have to provide all of the material, the computers, internet, cords, things like that for the employee to use? Um, so th there's no kind of one clear answer to that. It really depends on the nature of you know, that employment relationship. But there are some cases, and I've, I've seen and I've advised, employers to give their employee, um, uh, you know, the computer monitor, cords, mouse, et cetera, to use while at home. And if they're going to work from home, uh, in terms of, you know, the resources, internet, utilities, and things like that, there are, you know, there's tax implications for that. There are taxable benefit implications for that. But I do know some employers who give stipends to hybrid workers so that they, you know, so that the employer is covering the costs, the reasonable costs of, of allowing that employee to work from home, right? Now, like I said, there's there are other uh, there are other ways that can be done. An employer does not they're not required to pay an employee additional um, amounts to work from home. There are certain you know the tax forms that can be done, and the employee can can make those those decisions on their own. Uh, but really, I, I'm straying off topic there. Really, the the questions about health and safety. So I, I think if an employer is taking all reasonable precautions, uh, they're going to be kind of covered. Uh, across the country. Uh, but if you, if you have specific questions, I'm happy to kind of answer them uh, uh, offline or really at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I want to talk about employment contracts. And these are, you know, four of, you know, the, the more important terms that I've seen in relation to hybrid work. So number one, Full time and attention. These are, this is a clause, it's kind of one of the standard clauses you might see in any contract. Uh, sometimes I get feedback through clients where, you know, even for um, uh, a part time work, they, they take issue with the word full time and attention. Uh, but really, how it's been interpreted, well, and, and I should say this, I think it should go in every contract. So, after today's presentation or during, that's fine. Uh, take a look at you know the most recent contracts you have and see if there's a full time and attention clause. Really, that the employee will give their full time and attention to the employer. It doesn't mean they're working you know sixty hours a week. 
It means while they're engaged, you know, in doing the work for the employer. They are not doing, you know, other tasks. When they are paid to work for the employer, they're working for the employer. And this really has to do with this idea of, of overworking, if anyone has heard of it uh, online. It used to you know, be called moonlighting. Moonlighting being you know, a second job that an employee might have that they do, I guess, under the moonlight. But the more recent term, especially as it relates to remote workers and especially in the tech industry, is the idea of overworking. And it's really where an employee has more than one full-time job and they complete the tasks for all of their jobs unbeknownst to their first or second or third or or other employers uh generally at least in ontario i can't speak uh, on behalf of american law or, or other law in ontario the court would not really uh, uh put up with an employee who has two full-time jobs at the same time. If an employee is engaged by the employer between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., if they're doing other work for another employer, I think a judge would frown on that. An employment law in general would, would frown on that. So how do, we, how do we get around that? Well, I mean, there's a few ways. One, it's using this full-time and attention clause and leaving it you know, intentionally open so that it can be interpreted as widely as an employer uh, needs it. It could easily, you know, an employer might say, the employee agrees that when they are, you know, or when they're engaged by the employer, they're not going to, you know, do any other tasks related to any other employer, right? Is that like a non-competition agreement? We have to be careful. In Ontario, non-compete agreements are essentially void with a couple of exceptions. But we're not talking about competing against the employer. We're talking about while you're working for the employer, you only work for us. So it's it's a you know a new phenomenon, especially for um, for remote workers, really for fully remote workers. So it's something I think um, all employers should be aware of. Really, it has to do with you know I mentioned at the last point here, performance expectations and and what that employee is required to do. You know, there's an idea out there, well, if the employee is doing everything they're supposed to do, but they can do it in 20 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week, well, that's what, you know, that's the, the agreement between the employer and employee. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I, I wanna bring up artificial intelligence. It's not necessarily directly linked to hybrid workers, but it's something I'm I'm alerting all employers to, and and even I'm I'm you know having employers consider should there be a clause in every contract that employees will not use artificial intelligence to complete any of their job duties. Right? Someone is a hybrid worker. Okay, well the employer isn't directly overseeing their work, but really no manager is going to you know physically see everything an employee does, but the idea that there, you know, could be this, well, I mean, artificial intelligence that's collecting information from across the internet. Is it considered plagiarism? Is that the employees, you know, is that what you're paying the employee to do? Uh, there are you know, those new issues. It's really a, a, a brand new issue. There's really no judicial scrutiny of employees using artificial intelligence in their jobs. Uh, but it's something I think we'll see in the future. And then, you know, the last point I bring up about best practices, like I mentioned before, is performance expectations and deliverables. And I really do think performance reviews, you know, the feedback should be given constantly, saved in the employee's file. The performance review is reviewing the performance already given to the, uh, to the employee. And it helps to keep communication, you know, strong between the manager and the employee. And I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, benefits to that. Um, I'll touch briefly upon tax implications. Uh, I am not a tax lawyer. I'm not a tax expert, but there are some overlap with remote workers, hybrid workers, and tax. So number one, employees might request the employer complete the uh, T-2200. 
And there's a new one because of COVID T2200S. For employees who work from home, if they have used their home office for the benefit of the employer, they can you know, have the special form, it has to be signed and really completed by the employer so that they can make certain uh, claims to reduce their income tax on their personal income tax. So that's not a new thing because of, of uh, COVID or because of hybrid work. It's existed for, for many years. The employer has to confirm certain conditions of employment. Uh, you know, and I would say you know, the employer shouldn't unnecessarily or unreasonably withhold the signing of a, a T2200. If the employee does in fact work from home, you know, they, they may have their own home office expenses that they incur not paid for by the employer. So there are tax implications there. Uh, and then lastly, you know, there's the idea of payroll tax, which I'm, I'm not the expert on payroll tax, but especially as it applies to the province of Quebec, they, and really every province, but especially Quebec, they collect uh, payroll tax and tax in a different way. And there are agreements between provinces, um, if, if a company is based in Quebec, paid in Quebec, but they pay an employee elsewhere uh, in a different province, there are certain rules, certain forms as it relates to that. So it, it, for employees who are permanently, let's say, uh, working in two different provinces, not just on a fleeting basis, not just traveling, but permanently in, in one or two different provinces, it's definitely something uh, the employer should ask their um, uh, accountants about. Uh, the place of work. So I've already mentioned the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, even uh, minimum employment standards, they do vary across provinces. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not saying this to or, or to say, well, employers now have to know every single provincial minimum standard. In Ontario, the, the Employment Standards Act is very clear. If an employee works in Ontario, or if the work that they do outside of Ontario is a continuation of what they did in Ontario, then the Ontario Employment Standards Act will apply, okay? So if, if they're temporarily in another province, even possibly another country, but it's still a continuation of what they did in Ontario, then an employer doesn't have to worry about other different uh, employment standards applying. Uh, but really across, um, across Canada, there are, you know, some of these, these minimum standards do change slightly. I've mentioned, you know, over time, there's, uh, you know, leaves of absence that are changing, uh, that are different for each uh, province. So generally where the employee uh, lives and works, that is where, you know, the, the law that's going to apply. If it's a continuation of what they've done in Ontario, they can you know, then the Ontario Employment Standards Act uh, applies. Um, I, I realize we only have about five minutes left. So I wanna just briefly touch upon this, this new type of worker, just to put it on employers' uh, dashboards uh, uh, so that you know, they can think about, okay, well, how else may they want to organize their workplace, especially hybrid workers? The idea of these the new business consultant under the Employment Standards Act in Ontario. So to be brief, there are some, uh, some very specific terms in order to call an, uh, in order to call a worker, a business consultant. But if those terms are met, the worker is exempt from Employment Standards Act termination pay, vacation pay, holiday pay, leaves of absence. So it's not just, any worker, it has to be a business worker or IT worker. They have to operate through a corporation. Could be an unincorporated corporation or incorporated, but they have to you know, run it through a business. There has to be a written contract. They have to be paid at least $60 an hour. It does not necessarily have to be full-time hours, but they have to receive at least $60 an hour. And the employer has to follow that contract, they have to pay them on time, pay them you know, when they do work. This could be a way for some employers to, uh, you know, reduce the liability, reduce the amount of income tax or CPP or EI or health tax that is paid 
by the employer. Uh, so it's something, you know, it's, it's brand new. It's only about two months old. So I'm starting to hear more uh, employers who want to move their employees to this, this new type of business consultant. So if you do have more questions about that, or if you have existing contractors, independent contractors, but you want to make sure it's also compliant with the Employment Standards Act, let me know. I'd be happy to help with that. You know, we could talk a long time about uh, independent contractors. Today's not that day, but I'd be happy to talk about it uh, in the future. But this is a new area. Perhaps hybrid workers, hybrid employees could instead be business consultants or, or IT consultants. So it's something I wanted to put on the radar of, of all employers. And really, you know, I wanted to end the, 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 uh, my presentation just you know, briefly talking about the culture considerations. I think when we're dealing with employees, we're always dealing with, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to focus on the legal aspect of it, case law and, and legislation, but really there are, there are plenty of culture considerations which are going to be different for every employer, right? So there's, for any hybrid worker, really any worker, the idea of inclusivity and empathy and trust. Trust pervades the employment relationship. And especially for hybrid workers, because you trust that they're going to be working for you when they say they're working and, and produce the results that uh, they say they'll produce. I think consistency is so important for, for you know, any policy, but especially the hybrid work policy. Um, and that means really that the policy is clear, you know, and maybe it's been reviewed by a committee of employees, possibly the health and safety committee, or just a, a management employee committee to apply it consistently, right? Communication, flexibility, obviously very important. Um, and that's where I, where I understand a lot of, you know, workplace issues or, or misunderstandings generate from, from that lack of communication. Uh, we've talked a little bit about technology. I think, you know, a lot of companies can embrace technology, especially with the hybrid worker. There could be some uh, electronic monitoring that's done if the employer so chooses. And like I said, there's always time, in my opinion, for an employer to review their policies and adjust them if necessary. If hybrid is not working, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, if hybrid work is not working, there are many ways that it can be adjusted. It can be adjusted without notice. It can be adjusted with notice. If it's a more significant change, probably want to speak to you know, an employment lawyer about that just to make sure the liability is is, is capped and we're, we're you know, treating the employees fairly and in good faith. So there's always time for uh, policies to be reviewed and adjusted um, if necessary. So on that note, I'm happy to take uh, any other questions that someone has, if you wanna put them in the chat, um, questions about your hybrid workers, remote workers, or anything we've talked about today. But uh, otherwise, I, I thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I appreciate you listening. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, you can get in touch with uh, with me or Mbot, and I'd be happy to uh, to give that to you.